the female lead tells women's stories. Remarkable, diverse, inspiring. An educational charity promoting positive female role models who show the many different routes to success and fulfillment. So often I hear people saying, oh, how do I get started? How do I do this? How do you do it? You just start. You have to begin. And it won't be perfect and it'll be messy and it'll be hard, but you're doing something and you're on your way. Empowering future generations of women through films and a book of 60 women donated to 18,000 schools in the UK and USA, reaching millions of young people. And through our female lead societies, we help girls to discover new role models that speak to their passions, ambitions and careers. Through our research into social media and mental health, we found a solution to the negative impact of social media on teen girls. Through a simple intervention, which encouraged girls to follow different influences, we were able to change their entire social media experience and sense of well-being. We called this campaign, Disrupt Your Feed, and it reached 20 million people on social, with 330 million impressions all over the globe. So what's next? As well as inspiring girls, we're now finding ways to measurably improve the lives of older women through data, research and the stories of those who have overcome challenges and found their own personal versions of success. We're a long way from being finished. Join us in our mission. Are we going to talk about women's rights again? Yes, we're going to talk about it until there's balance. Hello, uh, welcome everyone. Welcome to our LinkedIn Live. Uh, we have a fantastic conversation, I think, today. I'm very excited for it. We're going to be learning how to be assertive and how to stop over-apologizing and using weak language. I'm going to be paying very special attention. I'm Edwina Dunn. I'm the founder of The Female Lead. And my project is all about helping girls and women see um, amazing women, diverse women, and hear their stories. So we have one of those women here tonight. Um, I'm very happy to welcome Joanne Lauterbach. And I realized, Joanne, I never asked you if I was pronouncing that correctly. You did a brilliant job, Edwina. Thank you so much for having me on. It's an absolute pleasure to meet you. Oh, that's wonderful. I'm very pleased. Okay, point one. That's okay. Good. <laughs> well, let me tell you first a little bit about Joanne, and then um, I'm going to ask a few questions. And uh, please remember that we do want your questions, and I know you listen very carefully, but um, I'll give you one more prompt. Um, just as we head towards uh, the end of the uh, session, where it's your turn to ask those. So I'll give you a little, a little nudge. Let me tell you about Joanne. Uh, her speciality is all about leadership communication. She has over 25 years in the business, um, and she has worked all over the world, born in Jamaica, but I think truly international with everything you've learned and practiced. And I think you have your own practice now in Toronto. Um, I do. Called Vate Consultants, which is wonderful. Um, what I love is that you talk about giving form and words to aspirations, which for me seems um, very poignant very, very important. So I think you're going to tell us a little bit about your program. Um, with no further ado, let me start 
with my first question to you. So, being assertive, not over apologizing. I mean, I'm completely guilty. Someone bumps into me in the street, I immediately say, Oh, sorry. I don't know right. why I do that, but I do it and I can't stop myself doing it. So, please help us to understand first why is this important to understand and why does this behavior um, appear in all of us and in all of us so often? I think it's in the ether. Edwina, it's, it's the way so many of us are socialized. I, I live here in Toronto and I have since 2013 and I've become so sensitized to it in my work. As you mentioned, I come from Jamaica, I come from Kingston and it's not in the ether there actually. So when I came here and I was doing my leadership development work, not just here, but also quite a lot in, in London, in the UK and, and in America too, every workshop I would run, which was broad in communication, the proverbial bad penny that would turn up every single time would be this business of minimizing language. And, and I, I tell you, there have been times where I've been brought to tears because I've seen the most accomplished women get up and make fabulous speeches. And afterwards I've said, wow, and their peers have, have told them that. And I'll never forget, it happened in London. This one lady came to me and said, it was just a lucky day. Mm. Mm. And, I, and I begged her, this is, year, this is years ago in London. And I said, please let us be the last day because you were fabulous. And so the stories we tell ourselves are the most important stories of all. And these stories drive the words that come out of our mouth. So if we're running some negative self-talk, it's gonna show up in our words. So I decided that, that I could help when I saw it happening in these workshops. And then a couple of years ago, my 10 year old came home minimizing my, my daughter, Olivia. And I thought, no, I, this, is, this is something that, that we just, our children are exposed to. They, they don't start off minimizing, but pretty soon it, it's, it's just all around and they, they pick it up, it becomes a habit. And I thought I would hate to see my daughter and my son because boys minimize too, as right. do men. Right. You know, be suddenly 25 in the workforce, having trouble advocating for herself because she thinks that's not who she is. But in fact, it's just a habit that she picked up maybe when she was 10. So I believe it's really important for the women that I work with in the corporate world, wherever they happen to be, the mothers at home, whose daughters and sons say, hey, why are you apologizing all the time? So where does this come from? Why, why do we do it? Abrina, were you ever told don't be bossy when you were a little girl? <laughs> yeah. 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 That's where it you comes know? from. There's that. For sure. And of course, this is so this the, the our culture that we're raised in can't be overstated. So when I look at the results that have come through in the survey, the top two reasons why respondents who are here with us today have said they minimize, the top reason is they don't want to be seen as aggressive. Mm -hmm. I mean, who does? That doesn't serve. Mm -hmm. So if we don't want to be seen as aggressive, Oftentimes we overcorrect into passive because we're conflating assertive with aggressive and it's not the same. Being assertive is very different and I'd be happy to give some examples to really clarify the difference between these various language forms. So there's that. And the second most prevalent reason is the fact that we think it's polite. We're doing it like out of good intentions. And I think the truth is there's some really negative possible consequences that we might not even be aware of. So we want to nip that in the bud if we can. And I think we can. Yeah, I, so I did the survey. I really enjoyed it, actually. And, you know, 
as I was completing it, I was thinking, mm, these are all the ways and times when it's very, very tempting to put right. on this nice me, you know, right. nice. I mean, there's a word that doesn't get used so much now, but, you know, uh, and, <clears throat> you know, when we're trying to behave ourselves and right. say not be too aggressive. So I think... I think you're right. It is in all of us and it happens all the time. So I suppose that does answer the question of why is it so important? Can you give us some examples? Can you help us to sort of hear for those who haven't done the survey, the sorts of things that, you know, are, are really typified, um, you, you know, with the kind of language that we use? Certainly. Again, the survey the top most frequent, there's three that I'll share the top three most frequent ways we're minimizing ourselves with our words. Number one is just, just minimizing ourselves. So we can see it in our emails to double check, but the truth is in writing, we spend a lot more time and we're more aware of what's coming out. So when we see it often, we'll delete it, get rid of that. Just checking in, just wanna know, but verbally, we're not as clear. What actually came out of our mouth? Often we don't know. So the justs happen. Maybe nowadays we're all working remotely and maybe we want to bring across an idea at a meeting we're at. And we might say something like, look, I just want to add, I, I, you know, I'm no expert here. I, I'm not, you know, I, I could be wrong. Hmm. And then we deliver a well thought out idea, which doesn't land. And we think, well, why doesn't anyone hear me? It could well be because we prefaced it with this justification. That's number one. Mm. The second most prevalent one is tagging. So tagging is when you, you stick something at the end of your great idea, seeking affirmation. So let's say I'm, I've done a... a a study and I'm presenting to the board my strategic vision it's thought through I know exactly what the data says and I'm confident so I've crafted my message and I want to go forward confidently and I say something like I'm confident that the best way for us to get the market share we're after in this area is to concentrate on serving this customer if that makes sense to you I just tagged it at the end or right, or I hope that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Or is if, if, if that's something that you think would work. And then I've undercut in the audience's mind my good idea. Mm. The third most prevalent form says the survey, and it bears out in my work otherwise as well, is deliberately softening. So making a conscious choice, this comes back to that, I don't want to be seen as aggressive. So if, I'm, if I believe that, that there's a, a job opening, for example, that I'm really qualified for, we know the stats are there that we women, it, it's harder for us to self-promote and to put ourselves forward. And it is a skill that's so necessary for us to get comfortable with so that we can say something like, I believe I contribute greatly to the team's effort in this area, which is why I believe I'm the best one for the job. If I deliberately softened it, it might sound something like this. I mean, far be it from me to toot my own horn and, you know, I don't know if I, if I could do everything correctly in the job or I'm not the per best person for it, but I think maybe you could. It'd be really great if you could consider me. They sound different, right? Oh, so different. And you know what is really scary is that as you describe those, I wouldn't have automatically picked up on them as being that softening language, but you know, it echoes in my ears. And I've said some of those things, you know, and I consider myself quite a punchy leader. But 
I do it. And you know what's even worse? <laughs> to, to yeah. tell me, you, first of all, you are a punchy leader. Look, this fantastic organization that uh, that you're bringing us all together so we can talk about it. So thank you on behalf of everybody who is listening. Thank oh, you. Oh, that's so nice. Thank you. Well, my confession is this, that, you know, I spent quite a large part of my career working with my husband who was my absolute co-partner very strong very able different skills different qualities to me but I used to get really I'm going to say annoyed because I would say something and then straight after he would say it and everybody would go yes that's right <laughs> What a good idea. And I'm yeah. beginning to wonder now, this used to be my favourite thing to say about what's it like to be a woman in an all-male boardroom. And I used to say, well, you know, and almost put the problem on the fact that the men listening would then say, well, Clive just made that point very mm. well. And I'm thinking maybe it was because I used some justs or softening or some tagging at the end and I'm really rethinking those moments this is really interesting wow Edwin I've heard that so many times as well and often my response is I can't tell you I wasn't there with you I can't tell you why you weren't heard sometimes it's our volume <laughs> like we didn't actually hear you other times it's how we prefaced it the words that we used are verbs. Oh, our verbs carry weight. So maybe we tagged. And nowadays with us, you know, this everyone's on Zoom or Teams or something. I read a, a, a article in the New York Times that talked about the fact that a lot of women don't want to put on their camera. So there's that. We want to be heard. It was hard enough in the boardroom. So there are a whole pile of virtual issues now. So the last thing we want to do is have our words let us down. Mm -hmm. Because that phenomenon you described, super common. Mm. Oh, I think it's so sad to think that there are so many people out there not wanting to switch their camera on. That really, it breaks my heart, actually, because, you know, we are all... You know, we are all significant. We are all important. And to, to feel, you know, that you don't want to be seen, that hits at the heart of my project because it yeah. is all about seeing is believing. Anyway, I'm turning it to myself. And it's not no, about no, it, you know, it's a, it's a problem of the moment. You know, mm. how, can mm -hmm. we, how can we embody, better embody who we know we are with the words that we choose, how we communicate, and now virtual communication is, is relevant. That's what we're living. So can you help us with some ways? Can you give us some things that we can practice and learn? Definitely. Where our, where our head is at in terms of conflating assertiveness and aggressiveness, is an important starting point because if we can embrace the the fact that this sort of work is not going to change you into somebody you don't want to be and embrace the fact that yes assertiveness is good it's positive then that that is the clear mental shift that can open up the the doorway to using language, that's in line with that. So I would say, check the stories. Some of them may need to be, you know, discarded because they don't serve you anymore. The, the negative self-talk that could be driving some of the, the language. The second thing I would say is find out what's coming out of your mouth. Easy enough, as I said in email, not as easy verbally because this sort of feedback is, I find kind of hard to come by, Edwina. A lot of times people don't want to give it to you. So can you find somebody who you trust who can give you trajectory shifting feedback, who can work with you? Mm. So the quiz is step one. You did the quiz, it takes two minutes. That can 
raise your awareness as to some habits that you may have that you get to look at very closely. And the third way to, to break the habit is to deconstruct the habit loop that you have around using minimizing language. What do I mean by that? Habit loops are driven by benefits. So if I, if I really am more interested in, in being seen as, as being nice and polite over everything else, I'm getting something out of that. So what am I being triggered? What words then come out of my mouth? And what's the benefit? So, so we, this work is very introspective mm -hmm. and we can rewire these habit loops. So for example, if I'm, more, if I'm a people pleaser and I don't like conflict and many, many of us are like that, the diminishing language when we are cued so there's a conflict coming and i'm cued if that's my habit loop my automatic habitual verbal response may be something like listen and, and i start to backpedal you know it's not that i disagree with you but you know you're probably right i mean you probably know better than me diminish 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 because i don't want the conflict and that's what i get out of it that's my reward I avoided a fight. So I want to still avoid a fight and I'm still going to get triggered. So to rewire this, we need to change the action in the middle. What other words could we be using instead? So when we have our awareness raised, we then look to replace words that, that work for us, that make us you know, feel authentic and, and are in line with who we know we are and we rewire it as we get rid of the phrase that doesn't serve and we substitute it with one that does, that doesn't minimize us because being assertive isn't aggressive. You know, this is, this draws you in. The way you talk draws me in, but now I'm thinking, okay, I need to learn a list of words that are assertive and, and cross them off my aggressive list or, you know, separate them from my aggressive list. So, so that's what I'm thinking about right now. Listen, I have to tell you, horrifyingly, I'm going to have to say to people, you need to ready your questions because I need to throw it open to the floor. Um, and, and, you know, the conversation is irresistible just mm. now. So just give me one example of how, uh, and then I'm going to... Um, then we're going to have the questions. Just give me one example of how something can be said assertively and not aggressively. Could you please? Certainly. Let's say I'm running a team and somebody should have delivered a report to me by the, is to deliver a report to me by the end of the day. I'm their boss. And in the past, they haven't delivered it on time. And I've sent them emails with emojis going, really <laughs> great. If you could maybe, smiley face, get this thing to me by the end. <laughs> I'm just doing my job. They're supposed to get the thing to me, you know? So if I was aggressive, I might say to the person, listen, I can't take this, this, so this is a Jamaican in me gonna come out, okay? So I can't take this foolishness anymore. Every single time you do a report, it's, late and this is you know it reflects poorly on me and you can hear the tone of voice changing and the expressions all of that comes together because aggressiveness it's not verbal only it's nonverbal. aggressive versus assertive by the end of the day the report i i look forward to receiving your report as as you promised if you have any questions or you need any assistance, do not hesitate in letting me know. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. It sounds so normal and obvious when you say yes. it, but I can see the trap. I felt the trap. And, you know, when you're kind of bubbling and boiling over, you know, out comes the aggression rather than the assertiveness or even worse, I'll just do it myself. Huh? Right. <laughs> passive aggressive it'd be great if you could maybe get this thing to me 
<laughs> Which oh, doesn't dear. serve us either, you know? We want I'm to be revealing. assertive. Totally. I'm revealing my bad habits. <laughs> now, our lovely audience, it is your turn. What are your questions, please? Chelsea, lovely question. How does humility play into this? It's not antithetical to being assertive. So I can be humble and assertive at the same time. I can be kind and assertive at the same time. So being assertive, if you go to Mayo Clinic, they've got this great article that talks about the fact that being assertive is a, a core communication skill that allows you to respect other people's opinions while putting yours forward confidently. So by all means, be humble. Be humble and assertive. Mm -hmm. Great. Very clear. Shuli asks, how do you manage not receiving positive responses to your assertiveness? Well, there's something called the double bind that we women have to contend with, and it is tricky. So I make the choice to hold the line being assertive. I know I could go into passive, but that, that doesn't, that that's not authentic. That's not who I know I am. So to counteract the double bind, I lean very heavily on my nonverbal communication. So I'll smile more. I'll make sure I'm as open as possible. And you will, if you read Michelle Obama's memoir, she talks about having to do the same thing. Kamala Harris, not long ago debating Mike Pence, did the same thing. They never diminished themselves, used minimizing language. They held the line, which I love. And they made sure that they are open and approachable while keeping the assertion solid. Mm. Great women. What female wow. leads those women? Oof. Yeah. My heart <laughs> overflowed <laughs> yesterday. It was you are not alone. No, absolutely. Brilliant. Now, Joy asks, how do I remind myself while I'm talking? How do you remind yourself? This is such a personal thing. I know some people, they have a rubber band. Everyone who does my program, they get a token to hang on to, and that can be the visual reminder. I believe it goes back to the stories we tell ourselves. So some of those stories are on a habit loop, too, that we need to get rid of. So if my new story is the best way for me to share my great ideas is to be assertive and I'm going to give it my all because it's not negative, then you stop having to remind yourself in the moment every day because it's now in your mindset. So I believe that is the best way to do it. Turn the switch in your brain. And can assertive be sometimes linked to passion? Is that assertiveness, that, that strength and confidence from I really believe this? Because we like the word passion, don't we? Yes, it can overflow. I am I'm really cognizant of that myself um, because I'm passionate about this. Yeah. And I'm a woman of color. The double bind is, is you yeah. know, something that, that I must contend with. I can't ignore it. And so I am mindful to make sure that my passion does not get perceived by my audience as, as being aggressive. Because that, that doesn't serve me. Mm. Mm. Yeah. So again, nonverbals, choose your words. We're, not, we're never talking about using aggressive words anyway. That's not what this is about. So assertive words, open body language. Mm, it's the combination. Correct. Exactly. Lovely. Lovely. Right. Swati asks, can you please provide more assertive versus aggressive examples? Yes. Okay, sure. Let me think of a, a situation. Okay. My boss comes to me, my plate's full, I'm doing so much stuff because I'm, you know, I'm an integral part of the team. My boss comes to me and says, Joanne, I'd love you to do X, Y, and Z, and I literally can't do any more. 
aggressive. You can't be serious. <laughs> you want like, when are you going to ask so and so to to do the project? Give me a break. Would you agree, Edwina, that we're in the aggressive space, right? Yeah. Yeah. Versus assertive. I understand why you would like me to take this project on. However, X, Y, and Z is on my plate, and I can't get to that until two weeks' time. So if that doesn't work for you, maybe you can come up with, with another uh, way to, to have this thing done, for example. Yeah. yeah. It's hard when it's hypothetical, isn't it? But I, I think that does give a good example. Yeah. Good. Yeah. And you have to breathe before you say that, don't you? You know, Because your first reaction is, boom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, we got to, again, go back breath. to what serves us. Yes, yes. Lovely. Rachel asks, can you explain more of the double bind idea? Sure. In the literature, in its simplest form, it speaks to the fact that women have a, uh, when women say the same thing as men, they can be perceived differently. And so it is not, it is quite easy for a woman to be seen as aggressive instead of assertive when all she is doing is stating her opinion. So there's a lot of research in this area that, that speaks to the fact that it is difficult for women to be seen as both competent and warm. Mm. that's what's at play. So if you are competent, then, then these negative associations are put on you as a woman and they're not put on men. Mm. And any of us who have worked in the corporate world know what, what this is about. Hillary Clinton talked about it at, you know, at length and many, many other women in the political sphere. So. This is why we need to pay attention to the words that we use, the verbal choices we make, and the nonverbal choices we make. It's quite a clever and demanding strategy, isn't it? That that whole idea. It's, you know, you're you're having to be really clear and strong, but at the same time, um, you have to not fall into the trap of projecting using body language perhaps in the same way. Yeah. So Jacqueline, yes, as a black woman, how do we manage to avoid the angry black woman image? This is absolutely to the point, isn't it? Whilst being a leader. Correct. I'm gonna, uh, Jacqueline, thank you. I'm gonna give you the advice that I read from Michelle Obama in Becoming. I'll never forget, the book's awesome. And what an incredible speaker. But she tells a story of being on the campaign trail way back when President Obama was, was Senator Obama seeking office. And she was making these speeches and we know how awesome she is as a speaker. And she was being labeled an angry black woman. And she writes in her memoir, that the team came to her to say, you know, we might have to pull you off the stage. Can you imagine taking her off because of this situation? And so they said that we want to show you the footage. She looked at the footage and she said, ah, I can see how my passion, we talked about this earlier, can be misperceived as being angry. So she worked with coaches to adjust her nonverbals. So I'm going to take a step back so you can see me a little more. Our nonverbals are really important. So if I did this talk like this, it's going to throw off a different impression than if I was open. So the Michelle Obama example teaches us that somebody who who is an accomplished speaker understood that 
she knew she wasn't aggressive, but it's the perception of the audience that counts. So if the audience could benefit from seeing you being a bit more open, smiling goes a long way. I know this, it happens to me too, I work at it. And it doesn't make you feel inauthentic. You're not compromising yourself. This is a tweak that serves you. Then go for it. It's great advice. And I think the bravery of watching yourself back on film or asking someone who will give you an honest impression, they are honestly the bravest things I think I've ever asked for personally. It's really humbling and humiliating when you realize what mistakes you make. Do we have time for more questions? There we go. Go, you know, how can we also improve our body language? Well, our last question. Yes, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to talk over you. Sorry. No, no. We're on Zoom, right? All the time. <laughs> My advice is to hit the record button. Record yourself. I would also say use your phone and and record your voice because so there's body language, but there's also voice. There's a lot happening there too in softening. And review it gently, knowing that that it's excruciating for all of us. We're so critical, but that's not helpful. We want to tamp down our inner critic and be able to look at our video and identify what we do really well. So we can keep doing it consistently and identify those areas that a tweak or two would serve us. So self-awareness is one step that's important. Use Zoom, do it today, hmm. <laughs> and or find somebody to help you. Feedback is a gift. I would like to close by thanking a very a wonderful friend of mine, Louise Duncan, who is in New Zealand. She opened my eyes a couple months ago to a way I was minimizing myself. So I really want the audience to know that we're all in this together. We have to, it's not once and done. And the way I, what Louise did for me was feedback. And I had shared with her and some other people in a small group about a success I had. And I said, twice in a row. Oh my God, it just came out of the blue. And twice in a row, Louise said to me, no, it didn't. <laughs> and the second time that happened, I, I nearly had tears in my eyes because she, she was giving me the biggest gift, which was letting me know that in my head, I was attributing my success to luck, not my efforts. <laughs> and I thought, oh, I will never ever say out of the blue again. Hmm. And I will have to dig deep and figure out why was I doing that and work to rewire that story. It's a lovely story. And one of my favorite sayings is, isn't it funny how the harder I work, the luckier I get? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Cause it is hard work, isn't it? But maybe I should be careful of the word lucky. Um, Joanne, thank you. That was amazing. I could talk to you all evening. It's fascinating. Um, but thank you. I have to let our audience go. I have to thank our wonderful audience. Thank you for the lovely questions. Uh, don't forget the quiz will be visible and online and you can all have a go at that. And uh, let me say something about next week before I say my final thank you. I am meeting and having our LinkedIn Live with the wonderful Bobby Brown next week, who is going to talk to us about her work and all the very hard years she put into that. Um, so same time, same channel. I'll see you all here. Until then, my very sincere thanks for a wonderful session. Joanne Lauterbach, thank you. Thank you.